a moment here and remind you that um, while it's great to acknowledge your likes and dislikes of things, I want you to go further. I want you to examine your cognitive dissonance. You don't think stories should be about farts. Um, short stories and literature should be about farts. Um, and value assumptions, you don't think stories uh, should ever address these kinds of bodily functions. You don't like war stories, um, etc. All the reasons that you don't like this story. That's fine, but then I want you to go past that and examine why the author would take such a risk and choose a subject that most civilized societies don't even mention in public, right? So um, go past your initial knee-jerk reactions and really examine a story. That's critical thinking. We need to be objective in our analysis if we are to learn about a story. So I want to talk about Peter Ho Davies for a moment. He is British. He is um, he has a, a one Chinese parent and one Welsh parent. So he himself is a Welshman. And he's um, dealing with British culture in this story as well as humanity and vulnerability. He embeds his themes. He's a very subtle writer. So for those of you who think this is a fart joke story, that is why, because he embeds his themes. This is clearly not a fart joke story if you dig deep into symbolism at all or, or think about it a little bit further. Um, so it's, he has a very compassionate tone in this story, and he's writing about something that really happened, a terrible massacre in South Africa. So well, yes, people find it really strange that he combines this um, topic of farts with the topic of war. Why does he do that? Instead of just assuming that he's a jerk, Maybe because he's a contemporary writer, because we would offer this kind of compassion to each other in our peer reviews, we could step back and examine why he does this. Um, so this is a highly symbolic story. It's deeply, deeply woven. It's, um, it's an incredible short story, actually. Uh, and I'm going to tell you why I think that. Symbolically, let's talk about the title, Relief, right? There's several different kinds of relief. There's an utterly false relief, which is named. And that is um, when, what is his name? Chard. Chard tells us he's relieved to find out that he's courageous. Well, that's a false relief, right? He already knows it. He's bragging there. There's the relief that poor Wilby feels because he's sick. He's actually sick. Why is he sick? Because he could not refuse bad venison from an officer, which leads us to another element of the story, which I'll talk about later. And then there is the relief that Bromhead will probably never have from allowing, against his best efforts, allowing a man to die, allowing a man to slip over the, the side and be disemboweled. So um, there's three kinds of relief there that are being talked about. And... Um, you know, it's very easy to just stop at the first one and think that's the only one. Um, or that charts is the other one. But there's, there's actually this woven what can be relieved and what cannot be relieved. There's other symbolism here that I would like you to pay attention to. This idea of gas, which happens in our human bodies because we're deeply vulnerable. We are human bodies. We are made of flesh. I have a friend who calls human eyes water bags with eyes, right? So Wilby is suffering from this illness. He gets this incredible opportunity, and he, and he blows it, right? And then, um, but let's look at this other idea. What else is being talked about the disin about the uh, about at the dinner table is disembowelment. Is it better to have bowels and make a fool of yourself at the dinner table? Or is it better to be disemboweled by the Zulus and die with all of your dignity and honor? This is something that's being raised here, right? They will slit you, I think the term, the description is from, from balls to breast, right? And then what escapes? The soul escapes. Do you see there's symbolic connection between that soul escaping and poor Wilby's gas escaping? So what is... What is termed acceptable and what is not? At least will be still alive, right? He still has his soul, but he's more shamed than the men who are being disemboweled. We honor them because they've lost their life to war. So there's this, this 
symbolic connection there. Now, this goes further, these Britishisms. This is also a story about the falseness of polite society, right? Wilby makes this terrible social faux pas and is sh and feeling shamed, right? Um, similarly, this Latin student is, Brahm had as a young Latin student, he's terrified everyone in every school will know him for of this fool who farts, even though everyone in the world does, right? But he's terrified of this shame that he, um, that he faces. And then here's the Welshman who is being pulled by Zulus on one side and pulled by Bromhead on the other, and he's still uttering politenesses, right? Thank you, sir. He's still uttering, these are the last words, these are the last words he will ever utter in his life. And he feels like, clearly, this is the right thing to say, this nice last politeness. Politeness. So um, this cultural, this is a cultural statement here about um, what is proper. I mean, really, what is proper, right? That's funny. There's there's a, there's humor to all of this story. There is a thread of humor, which is also about being human, which is also about being vulnerable, right? Who has no sense of humor in the story? Chard. You know what? Chard is the guy who can just sit there and dispassionately describe the massacre of his compatriots, of his men. He just describes the massacre calmly while commending himself for his own courage. He is the least person who will accept and acknowledge his humanity in this story where Brahm had becomes much more sympathetic person because he lets Wilby off the hook, poor Wilby, by telling his own story. And then he remembers, this is not the heroic, these people, these men, they clearly want a heroic story. But Bromhead, in his refusal to give him give them one, is kind of pointing to the fact that war is not a beautiful, wonderful thing, that it's a terrible thing, that terrible things happen. That's why his story exists. And uh, it's an interesting story also in that it uses these different points of view that really deepen it, right? We're not stuck in Wilby's shame, Wilby's obsession with what happened, Wilby's relief. We move into Bromhead. And I think that's a signal that this is a deeper story, that all of these different men have these different points of view, these different vulnerabilities. Bromhead is going to feel guilty all the rest of his life about this man, which is a very serious um, sort of relief that he will never be granted. Um, let's see what else I wanted to say. Oh, and the idea, the reason why I chose this as a trauma story is to point out that not all stories start out with trauma, right? Like um, murders and car accidents and divorces and these larger things. There can be trauma in the everyday, like this boy in this Latin class who fears that every childhood classroom all over his country is going to hear about him through this game that they play. Uh, that is a kind of trauma. There are many kinds of trauma in the world. And this begins with something that could be, if Bromhead did not save Wilby, it could be something that ruins his career. It could potentially be a trauma. So what I wanted to do is point out the different kinds of um, psychological trauma that your stories could begin with. So I just would like you to consider those possibilities. And, um, and in the future readings, I want you to um, really think about why the author made certain choices. If you are reacting negatively to a story, think about the risk that the author takes that you are not the only one who will react negatively, right? And, um, and I really suggest some more compassion for these stories. These are, these are our peers, just as everyone in this class is a peer. And um, studying them is, is at the very least what they are due for, for writing this, for um, doing the hard work of getting it published, for um, taking risks in the writing. Okay, so uh, that's where I would like to move from in the future. I hope you have a wonderful Wednesday.